Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so this is one of the series of talks uh, that uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, we started with uh, uh, oxygen delivery system, and today we'll be talking about monitoring the uh, respiration and uh, ventilation. Um, um, and I hope it will follow by um, other talks in the near future. My name is uh, Dr. Yahya Ithawi, and I'm an uh, in-house neonatologist and a pediatrician. And um, I'm doing this uh, as, um, as a way to communicate to and help other uh, pediatricians to improve uh, care of uh, um, sick children. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with, the, with the talk. And uh, uh, today talk will be about uh, respiration and ventilation monitoring. Um, so my objective in this uh, talk is to give you a list of these uh, uh, tools to monitor ventilation and respiration, which and, uh, will also um, have very uh, short glimpse on the uh, clinical part. And we'll talk about the x-ray, the gas, and non-invasive uh, gas monitoring and the end monitoring the uh, mechanical ventilation. So uh, I'm not going to go talk about the clinical part of it because um, this is not the purpose of my talk, but uh, you can assess the respiration by looking at nasal flaring, grunting, retractions, tachypnea, cyanosis. You can auscultate the sound, but also you can use non-invasive monitors like a respiratory monitor, like heart rate, like oxygen. You can do um, chest x-ray, you can do blood gases, you can look at something called graphics and loops to monitor uh, ventilation. So um, I'm going to talk um, about x-ray. And the purpose of this x-ray is not to talk about x-ray finding in respiration or in prematurity or in neonate or in, in pediatric, but to talk about uh, the uh, monitoring part of using x-ray. So uh, how you monitor is uh, first you um, want to see whether you are underinflated or overinflated when you are ventilating a patient by counting the number of ribs. And usually we like the ribs, so it could be somewhere between seven to nine. If it's more than nine, then probably you are hyperinflated. If it's less than seven, so probably you are underinflated. The other thing, you look to the, uh, the space between the ribs. Are they crowded or they're separated? It'll give you an idea about. The other thing is you look about the level of the diaphragm. Is it flat or not flat? Um, and that, that will give you an idea uh, uh, whether you are hyperinflated or underinflated. Also, you look to the size of the heart. Is it squeezed and small or it's, it's a big size? If you don't have the ability to eyeball it, you can measure the CT ratio. So it should be somewhere between uh, 50 to 70. Um, and um, you need to know whether it's hyper or hypoinflated. Uh, the other way of using x-ray is to know where is the tip of the ATT. And usually it should be somewhere between the um, the level of joining of two clavicles to the uh, carina. And also you look to the uh, symmetry of both sides, whether symmetrical or symmetrical, this will give you an idea whether you are um, bilaterally uh, ventilating or you're selectively intubating, uh, ventilating one lung. Uh, the other way to monitor the uh, respiration and ventilation by doing the blood gas. So we have three ways of doing blood gas. You have the arterial blood gas, you have the capillary blood gas, or venous blood gas. The best would be the arterial blood gas because it gives you a good indication of all the components of blood gas and especially the oxygen. And remember, there is a measured value and there is calculated value of this. The other one is the comparable uh, to arterial blood gas is CBG or uh, capillary blood gas. The only thing that is not comparable is the partial pressure of uh, oxygen. It's not as accurate as arterial blood gas. The venous blood gas, on the other hand, is not indicated and should not be used. The only uh, two indications I would think of if we need to calculate the oxygen consumption rate. So you have arterial blood gas, you compare it with the venous blood gas, you see the difference of partial pressure of oxygen and tells you how much the body is consuming. The other thing is, is doing venous. If you don't have other ways, you can do arterial, you can do capillary for any reason, then you do venous blood gas. Um, and, and, and arterial blood gas, it can be of two types. It can be an indwelling catheter, which is the best because it has a better uh, uh, sampling uh, way, or, or a stop uh, using one time sample of arterial blood gas. These are um, the acceptable values. I hate 
the to say normal values because normal values can vary uh, between um, you know depending on the situation if we say one day baby just ventilated difference from one month old uh, chronically ventilated different from five years on asthma, asthma or ventilated different from upper airway and ventilated so i would not like uh, uh, the word normal i would like to say whether uh, acceptable or permissible or not also, you can see that there is a here a base excess and base deficit. Base excess and deficit are almost same, but base excess is mean plus, base deficit mean uh, 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 below zero or minus. But you can use the same base excess, but you put minus on the, uh, or you can base the base deficit and you put plus and give you the same meaning. So you can use base excess, base deficit to, uh, um, talk about minus or on, or because one of them and put some uh, a sign of plus or minus in front of them to give you the same meaning. Always remember to use uh, to do you compare the temperature of the machine in comparison to the temperature of the body, because if the temperature of the machine is 37 while the body is we're cooling and giving hypo uh, therapeutic hypothermia, then will give you abnormal reading, and also. Remember to do a gas in the best situation where the uh, your SAT monitor is more than 88. Because if it's less, um, usually it's 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 hard to uh, to uh, I mean you know that they are not doing good in ventilation and probably is not a good time to do a blood gas. So it's always better to well saturate the patient before you do blood gas. There are other ways of monitoring uh, blood gas. What we call it non-invasive, and the important of this they are continuous. They are not only one sampling time. And it drops the, uh, the need for blood. And also it decreases the incidence of iatrogenic blood loss. And of course, it has less cost. Um, but always remember when you do continuous blood gas monitoring, it's necessary to calibrate. So it's necessary to do a blood gas, to calibrate with the machine. And also blood gas, non-invasive blood gas monitoring, it does not give you the acid-based status. Also the most of non-invasive it will not tell you whether the patient having more oxygen or hyperoxia so for these reasons um, you have to do a blood gas sometime even if you are monitoring with non-invasive blood gas monitors the first one is the first one non-invasive is pulse oximeter it measures the relative absorption by the light the relative of and compare the saturated to non-saturated hemoglobin uh, so it does not measure which unsaturated hemoglobin. It just compares saturated to unsaturated. So even if the hemoglobin is carboxyhemoglobin or or um, carboxyhemoglobin or it's um, uh, uh, methemoglobin, it does not mean it, it cannot measure it. Uh, but it only tell you a difference between saturated and unsaturated. So it's not a good way to measure, for example, methemoglobin. If you want to measure the methemoglobin, because it's a part of one of the types of abnormal hemoglobin, you have to use another pulse oximeter called co-pulse oximetry. In addition to the saturation, it gives you the pulse rate or the heart rate. The limitation, it's not good for higher or level, lower PaO2 level. It's very good when the, uh, the uh, saturation values are this range, 88 to 93, but it's not good and it gives you about, it correlates to the uh, partial oxygen pressure of 40 to 80. But when it's high or low, SAT is not a good uh, measurement of real partial pressure of oxygen. That's why APG or arterial blood gas is indicated. So the advantage is because it measures light, it, cannot, it, it does not cause skin irritation. And it does not need uh, frequent calibration. And because it's not neutralized, so it's less affected by skin changes, whether it's a temperature or perfusion. The disadvantage has a lot of artifact when patients move or there's light. Also, as we said, it does not measure the abnormal hemoglobin. It measures unsaturated hemoglobin, whether that's a methemoglobin or a carboxyhemoglobin or other type of hemoglobin. So we need to measure um, methemoglobin Pulse oximetry is not a good choice. Either use a blood gas to tell you how much methemoglobin is, or use co-pulse oximetry. The other type of uh, non-invasive uh, blood gas monitoring is transcutaneous oxygen. It does not measure the saturation, 
it does not compare saturated to unsaturated hemoglobin. It measures the actual partial pressure of oxygen. And therefore, um, it uses electrolyte, it uses contact, surface contact, use electrolyte solution and a membrane. And therefore, it needs frequent calibration, almost four to eight hours. Every 48 hours, you have to calibrate. And because it's contact and use electrolyte, it causes a lot of irritation and it can cause thermal burn. And it is, uh, because it needs contacts, it's affected by the status of skin. So when you have a poor perfusion, you have a bad transcutaneous oxygen level. And these perfusion can be shock, acidosis, hypoxia, hypothermia, edema, or anemia. The advantage is non-invasive, and it's not like pulse oximeter. It's um, a good way of measuring high values of partial pressure oxygen. The other type of non-invasive blood gas monitoring is transcutaneous CO2 monitor. It ex use, uses exactly the same principle of transcutaneous oxygen monitor. Have same advantage, same disadvantage. The other way is using end tidal CO2 uh, to measure the uh, uh, CO2 level. And it measures the oxygen in the expired breath using infrared spectroscopy and it correlate very well with the actual PaCO2 or partial pressure of CO2. And this is an example when and where uh, to measure the um, entitled CO2. I'm not gonna go and speak about detail of this picture, but uh, you can see that it's here a starting expiration and the measure CO2 is going up and going up until it reaches the maximum point and here we measure at the end of expiration. And then when patient inspire, the CO2 level goes down in the CO2 detector. So here where we measure the end tidal CO2. Um, the end tidal CO2 is uh, increasingly available. It's very rapid so because it's dynamic and continuous. You don't need to, uh, to wait for processing. The limitation is, you know, that CO2 detectors of two types, the mainstream and side stream. Um, so the mainstream where you put uh, a piece of tube inside the circuit at the ATT port, it will increase the dead space. Um, so for example, if you're ventilating a premature baby of 500 grams and you're giving VG of four, then the total um, the volume of, of mils that the patient getting is two mils. So if the dead space, let's say it's 0.5 mil, that's a huge difference adding to the dead space. The other things is the respiratory rate is high. So when the respiratory rate is fast, this, point, it will be become very close to this point. So it becomes, there's a little bit of confusing of the machine where to measure. So it will become when the respiratory rate is high, the measurement is less accurate. And because most of the premature babies, again, have a higher, higher respiratory rate, then, and again, it's that's a disadvantage of using CO2, uh, entitled CO2. The other way affecting CO2 is the humidity. So when the humidity is excessive, it causes some mechanical type of mechanical obstruction and give you high CO2 level. And therefore, because of these reasons, it's very limited to uh, use uh, entitled CO2 in premature babies. The advantage is non-invasive and it's correlated very well to the uh, PaCO2 in arterial blood gas and it's uh, uh, dynamic continuous monitoring. The other way of monitoring blood gas, um, the uh, ventilation is using inspired oxygen which is the amount of oxygen is giving. And it starts by room air until full 100%. Either we use it in a percentage wise, 21 to 100%, or we can measure it in decimal, 0 0.2121. The other way is measuring the arterial pressure, which is um, using a, a sensor at the ETT connector or within the ventilator to measure the arterial pressure. And the way of measurement depending on the machine type of ventilator. Um, and the ventilator, when measuring airway pressure, give you the set and measured value. So two values. And these two values in the mandatory breath and in spontaneous breath. And first type of, PI, of airway pressure is the PIP, which is the maximum pressure during inspiration. And the other one is the PEEP, which is the pressure need to keep alveoli open. And it's measured during expiration. And the, usually the, uh, the PIB is somewhere between three to four and may goes up to six to five centimeter of water. Now, how to know what is the best? 
uh, PEEP is the best PEEP to keep alveoli distended and maintaining a good contact between the alveoli and the arteries. When you increase the PEEP and this, you cannot achieve a better contact, then probably you don't need to increase. And you can see here, there is when you give zero PEEP, a alveoli is collapsed, but when you go five, you have a good distension, more distension at 10, a little bit more at 15, but after that, there is no distension. And here is very good, and you can see the diameter is increasing, increasing until you see a point where the increasing PEEP does not um, give you more distension and more contact between alveoli and the uh, arteries for better perfusion. And therefore, I think the best PEEP would be somewhere between 14 to 15 centimeter of water. Um, the other uh, parameter of monitoring ventilation is the mean airway pressure. You can use this sample as mean airway pressure. However, it's sometimes confused between mean airway pressure and mean arterial pressure, which is the blood pressure measured uh, whether peripheral or by arterial line. So that's why we sometimes we use the abbreviation PAU. Um, and it measures the amount of a pressure during whole inspiratory cycle in upper way and alveoli. And it correlates very well with the mean lung volume for any type of uh, uh, ventilation. Um, usually when it becomes more than 15, it gives you a complication like a, what we call it air leak during mechanical ventilation, whether it's a pneumothorax or a pulmonary interstitial emphysema. And very important to remember that mean airway pressure of high frequency is totally different from mechanical ventilation. So we're talking here about mechanical ventilation, conventional. And this is the um, colored area is what, what we call it the mean airway pressure. And it, you can see it affected by PEEP, it affected by PIP, it affected by the rate, and it affected also by the time. And you can see different shapes of uh, PIP. It depends on the type of ventilation, which is not the purpose of this talk, but this area is the map. So map actually measure all the uh, PIP, the PEEP, the flow, the time, the rate, all can contribute to MAP. And so that's why a MAP is a good general idea about how we are ventilating. Um, the other way of monitoring is get taking minute ventilation. Minute ventilation represents the rate times the tidal volume. So if the rate is 40 and the tidal volume is 6.5, you get minute ventilation of 600, 260. So that's a good also way of saying how much volume the patient is getting in one minute. The other way of monitoring is loops. And loops is a, a way to compare between two parameters of breathing. For example, pressure volume loop or flow volume loop. And it measures the dynamics in one respiratory cycle. It does not tell you the changes over time, but it's compare different phases of a respiratory cycle to each other during one respiratory cycle. And uh, uh, flow volume give you idea about resistance. And flow pressure volume will give you idea about compliance. And compliance is the changes in alveoli, while resistance is the changes in the airway. And this is an example of loops. So you can see that the uh, inspiration started at the peak and goes up, up until it reached to a higher PIB and then go down. So the best loops of pressure volume would be uh, some type of oval shape. If you give more distension to pressure, you won't get a better volume. And that's why you are overstretching, but you're not getting benefit. And that's why the shape become notched and peaked. If this come closer to the volume, then you're giving under volume. Now the talk is today not about what is the best loops, but it just gives you idea that loops can be used to monitor ventilation. The other way to monitor, as we said, compliance, which is this distensibility of the alveoli. So the more alveoli is distensible, the better is the compliance. And the resistance, which give you the status of airways. And um, um, it measured, airway resistance is, um, increase and decrease depend on how much flow you're giving and what is the status of upper airway. So when we uh, monitor ventilation, we talked about 
in, uh, f uh, about um, uh, FiO2, fraction of respired oxygen. And we talked about pressure, and the pressure is PIP, PEEP, and MAP. And then we talked about minute ventilation, um, loops, uh, target volume, um, minute volume, and we talked about compliance and resistance. The other way is time constant. And time constant is um, uh, three t is, is uh, the uh, result from multiplication of, of compliance versus resistance. And it's usually 0.12. And the normal T1 that we like to see during inspiration is around three times the, um, the normal, the tidal volume, the, the normal um, inspiratory time that we need is usually we like it to be uh, three times that of uh, the, uh, the uh, time constant. The, you know, the purpose of this talk, not to talk about time constant, but just to mention that time constant is one of the way also to monitor ventilation. The other way to monitor mechanical ventilation is using tidal volume, which is amount of volume or distension uh, volume in one respiratory cycle. And usually we measure it in mil, and um, it's usually adjusted with, uh, uh, to the weight. So we say mil per kg. And the, the tidal volume is, is the result of flow in time. So the more flow you give, the longer the duration, you get the better volume. And it also can be measured by dividing minute ventilation times by the respiratory rate. The other way to monitor ventilation is the graphics, which is comparing a parameter of uh, ventilation against time. So you can hear, uh, and that's why it gives you the changes over many respiratory cycles over time. It does not compare one respiratory cycle. And we can use pressure, we can use flow, and you can use volume and compare it and see the changes of these parameters against time. And of course, the graphics of, of these three parameters depend on the type of ventilation and type of support and um, uh, what happened to the patient. And thank you very much. That's end my talk today. I uh, uh, re-record this because there was a lot of interruption during previous talk and I am going to upload it on the uh, uh, YouTube channel for anybody who want to listen to this talk. Thank you very much and have a nice day.